Uh, my name is Marie Sigomas. as I'm the museum's public programs manager and I'm really excited to be here with you all tonight for this member exclusive event alongside our collections manager Kathleen Aston. And uh, before we get started, I did just want to thank you all for being members of the museum and say that the, the whole reason why we have this monthly series called the collections close up is for our members because we know that you are the people who care most about our organization and who care most about the objects that we steward within our collection. So these are opportunities for you to get to know those objects a little bit more. Um, and also I wanted to acknowledge that, you know, today we are going to be looking back on the museum's long history. We're celebrating 115 years as an organization. Uh, next Friday is our anniversary and we're really excited about that milestone. But also as we look back on that long history and the, the first day that we opened our doors and the many doors that we've had since that first day. It's not lost on us that as we celebrate the milestone, our doors are currently closed. Um, and it's got us thinking a little bit about what does it mean to be a museum? Because I'm sure for a lot of you, you think of a physical space when you think of a museum, right? Um, and so I'm wanting us to all noodle on that a little bit. And maybe you can also use the chat uh, send your answers to all panelists and attendees, but let us know what do you think of when you think of a museum? What's your definition of what a museum is? What do you expect from an organization that calls itself a museum? And while you are noodling that and writing down some thoughts, maybe it's three words, maybe it's a sentence, um, I would like to ask that question of our collection manager, Kathleen Aston. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, Marisa. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so before we get started, Kathleen, do you want to share, maybe, I'm sure you have so many thoughts on what it is to be a museum because you kind of nerd out on this stuff and we talk about this all the time, but um, so maybe I can reframe the question for you and ask, when you were a child, and I'm sure you were a child who loves, loved museums, what was a museum to you? What did you think of when you thought of museums when you were maybe a, a younger person? And has it changed for you since then? Well, I feel really lucky because uh, the I would say the museum I spent the most time as a child was this place called the Lindsay Wildlife Experience, um, which I think when I was a kid was called like the Lindsay Wildlife Museum um, in the San Francisco East Bay. And it was always a really dynamic experience. Um, there was everything from like, you know, exhibits about birds to like bones and um you know uh scat and like actual like live animals that had been like hurt and were then just like you know under the care of the museum um and so it was just it was really cool for me to have so many different like various ways to engage with the stuff that the museum was trying to communicate about and that's something that i think has really grounded my appreciation and like all the different lenses a museum can provide on a on a topic or an issue yeah yeah that's interesting because um as we enter this time now where our doors are closed, I think we have been um, living that reality a lot in the fact that I think, you know, for me, one of the definitions of a museum is it, it has to do with the museum's mission. And often that has to do with deepening understanding for a community, for people, connecting people with understanding and knowledge about a particular subject and also um, sharing culture and that can be done in a lot of ways beyond physical objects and physical spaces and so for us gathering tonight virtually we're doing that too right um and so there's there's a lot that a museum can be beyond those physical spaces while physical spaces are also really important some people in the chat have shared with us that a focused collection is an important part of what it means to be a museum also interesting stuff. So something of note, something of maybe intrinsic value or interest. Um, teachers of all aspects of history, science, and nature. So teachers, so this act of um, being the purveyors of sharing information in a way that connects to people. Um, and so we do that in, in a lot of ways. And we've done that for a really long time. Again, 115 years. And I'm excited to learn a little bit more about that long history today and also specifically what it takes to take care of these collections, which is the bulk of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but also I want to acknowledge that over the course of that long 115 years and the many homes that the museum has had, each of those homes have been on the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Uyghur people. And that's a part of our history too. 
and it's a part of our continued narrative as an organization and as a community. So we want to make sure that we acknowledge that as we talk about these physical spaces mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, so we are going to be jumping into our presentation now and if you have questions as we continue on, please use the chat to share them with us and we will um, we will cover them. So without further ado, Kathleen, what are we talking about today? Um, so we are going to begin today's presentation talking about the sort of spaces that the museum has occupied and we're going to look at it. We're looking at what is a museum here from a very collections oriented lens, um, which is, uh, I know I mentioned that I really enjoy all the different things a museum could be, but it's very much the lens in which I engage with the museum. I'm excited that the longer that I've been here, I've been getting to engage with different aspects of what we do. Um, but this is gonna be a very collections focused, like the, the journey of our collections through different areas um, piece. And what we're really gonna look at is sort of like, the spaces the museum was, uh, the sort of changes that happened in the collections as they transitioned between spaces, um, looking primarily at um, like firsthand newspaper accounts from the day, which uh, is one of my favorite things to research. Uh, historical newspaper accounts are wild. Um, and so that's mostly what we'll be seeing here today, but I do wanna note that like, there are so many different intersectional events in the history of Santa Cruz. I know we have a really rich community of history and natural history interested folks. Um, and so there's lots of different things to cover and I'm gonna try to keep it to um, within a specific time frame. but if there's other things we wanna talk about, there will be like time for that at the end. Um, so I guess I'm gonna share my screen now. Oh wait, here we go. Okay, so looking here um, at a picture of the Santa Cruz Lighthouse. Um, which was built in 1869 um, and as many of you probably know relocated due to some complications with sea caves in 1879. Um, this picture is from the late 1880s and you can see up top at the lighthouse that Laura is there um, and then this is probably some members of her family although it's a little harder to see. Um, and so this uh, was, you know, Santa Cruz's first lighthouse. Um, uh, and one of my favorite comments about it comes from Frank Perry's his, uh, book, uh, about Lighthouse Point, um, illuminating Santa Cruz history, I believe, which is a really great read for anyone who's interested in any topics associated with this. Um, but he mentions at one point that the Santa Cruz Lighthouse was to be just that, a house with a light on top. Um, and so it was really just sort of like a, a single family dwelling with like the lighthouse tower popped on top. Um, and we can see in his book, actually, he has plans. Um, from the design of the lighthouse, which I believe was actually designed in 1864. Um, and so you can see it was like a pretty modest facility. The Hecox family um, lived here for, you know, decades. Uh, and another thing that lived in this space, which I'm sure we all know about, this is our foundational myth, was Laura Hecox's collection. Um, so we can see here cabinets that were built by Adna Hecox, who was also involved in the collecting and interested. There's going to be some articles later on. You'll see that um, sometimes Laura's collection was ascribed to Adna. Um, and so Laura gave public tours of the lighthouse. She was required to do so. But in addition to the general, you know, being able to engage as citizens with the government built lighthouse, you would also be able to engage with her collection, which was um, rich in marine specimens, fossils, um, non-fossil shells, birds, eggs, um, ethnographic items like baskets, curios of various stripes. Um, and all of this was stuff that she was actively like showing to the public. Um, she was uh, taking it to, we can look at some articles about some stuff that was going on at the time. Um, we see this fascinating collection of shells and curiosities displayed by the keeper noted here. Um, where it talks about how in 1884 uh, there were a registered 1,300 visitors. So there were a lot of people who were engaging with the collection even before it became the city's museum. Um, you can see that also even before it became the city's museum, Laura was lending uh, exhibits of different specimens and curios to the public library and that those exhibits were already inspiring um, a demand for books about natural history. And so there's also some stuff from the time talking about how she was taking these things to county fairs and exhibits. Um, and so she was really invested, not just in having those things for herself, but in sharing them with people. Um, and that's like one of, when I think of like an aspect of like what a museum is, it's um, private collections can of course also be museums, but really I often think of this like dynamic exchange with the public. Um, and you can also just see some cool articles of other stuff Laura was going, uh, going about at the time. Uh, she 
is referenced here as making an appeal for saving local wildflowers. She was, of course, while this collection was happening, still um, tending the light every day um, and doing other sorts of essential lighthouse keeperly duties, like noting the weather. Um, so uh, we see that the, um, already Laura had a relationship with the local library um, community. Uh, this, these articles are from 1900 and 1901. Um, the interest in developing a Santa Cruz library um, was started sort of in the late 1860s and the 1870s, but it wasn't until 1904 that a purpose-built library building was created. Um, it was funded in part um, through uh, the Carnegie Foundation's uh, library initiative. There were four of them were built in Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, at this time, everyone was super excited about finally having this building. There was like huge community effort um, in celebrating this. And one uh, big important part of that for a lot of folks was getting a permanent installation of exhibits in the basement of the library, which had been built to accommodate additional books, but which at the present or at, the, at that time, they then wanted to have um, educational exhibits. And so Charles Anderson, who was a member of the library board and a local luminary and naturalist himself, um, has a lot of really, if you read the blog, like great impassioned quotes about the value of a museum and a library um, supporting one another, one providing examples of the natural world and one providing explanations of them and how great that would be for the public. Um, and so that great thing for the public did in fact happen. You have all these wonderful, excited newspaper articles from the time talking about how people loved the additions to the library, talking about um, Laura would even put out lists of other people whose collections were given along with hers to the library. Um, so it's a really like robust community effort. Um, at one point, there's an article about how you know, someone mentioned in the comments like the notion of a focused collection being important for a museum. Well, that is, I think, a really great way to think about it, but it's also true that the notion of a museum has changed a lot and, um, you know, starting from these sort of eclectic curio cabinets where people were basically building these objects that showed they were fluent in being curious or understanding about the world around them. Um, to even in the early 1900s, people were so excited about this new library museum and there were calls in the paper that actually there was one article that even said, bring anything you might have at home, any old thing might be useful to the library museum. Like they wanted people to come and offer things. Um, there's also some really, you know, fun articles uh, that show that like Laura and her mother were both working on, um, excuse me, the Mrs. Hecox were working uh, hard to get the uh, collections ready for the museum. Um, and you also have a lot of articles at the time talking excitedly about the new cabinets that we're building to house the collections objects. Um, there was, uh, I guess, some custom built cabinets that took a long time and were being sort of narrated by the press as like, we're getting closer, one of the last cabinets is finished. Um, and I'm in part so excited about that because I am a nerd um, and also because the storage um, and how you build and um, customize the storage for collections objects is something else we're gonna talk a little bit about later. Um, so uh, here's some pictures uh, from that. So this is the uh, library from the time, from the, uh, I think it is from 1904, uh, when the um, opening reception for the Hecox, excuse me, when the library opened, which was a year before the Hecox uh, collection was first opened at the museum, which is why this month is our anniversary. It's been 115 years. I know years. Um, and then uh, to the right, you can see uh, a picture of the basement of the library. So this is actually, it's a little bit anachronistic and I'm sorry about that, but it's from the 60s when you actually see that books did in fact expand into the basement of the library building. Um, this is not the current library building, it was later torn down, um, but uh, you know, in the early 1900s, the library was growing, it was expanding into the basement of the facility. Um, and so the uh, museum needed a new home. Uh, nearby, uh, this is the original Santa Cruz High School, um, which was uh, built in, I believe, 1897, um, that was then ultimately burned down in 1913. Uh, and the reason we bring that up is because it's so fortunate that it was in 1913 it burned down and not a few years later, because around 1916, 1917, the Hecox collection was actually moved from the uh, public library to the high school. Um, and partly that was partly a, a space need. So just very much the like practical concerns of like, oh my gosh, we don't have room for this. Um, and partly it was also to do with everyone getting excited about the notion that like people were using the collections 
there, like high school students were coming and like looking at them for as objects of learning and their studies. And also because the high school was preeminently the place in Santa Cruz where numbers are engaged in study. Um, and you can tell that the community was really proud of like the education that was going on at the high school and that they were really excited to have this opportunity to really engage with the um, educational aspects of what a museum collection could offer a public. Um, and so you have that sort of like shift from like display to a real period of use that was going on for the collections at this time. Um, meanwhile, so, you know, the museum, the uh, Keacock's collection, which was the city's first public museum, is now being housed at the high school and it's being used in this more educational way. Um, in the meantime, a gentleman named Humphrey Pilkington, who's responsible for our, our other, one of our other foundational collections, um, willed his personal collection of a lot of Native American artifacts and then also natural history museum, uh, natural history specimens to the city um, on the condition that a museum be provided to house it, otherwise it would go elsewhere. Um, and so this really galvanized a lot of community interest. Um, this was a bequest, Humphrey Pilkington passed away um, not long after this, uh, well, the way the class works. Anyway, so this was in part because Humphrey um, passed away without, you know, um, anticipating uh, where his collection would necessarily be stored. And he had some good friends in this community who were also, one of them was a high school teacher. Um, several of them ended up being involved in the, um, the museum board of trustees that then really got together and said, okay, we really need the real Santa Cruz museum this time. Um, and that ended up getting located in Seabright. Um, here at uh, what is the Terrell House, or what was the Terrell House, which was um, given, it was a, a family of like, you know, Seabright was a really big cultural center um, in Santa Cruz, and um, William Tyrell, who originally owned this house, um, later left it to his niece, who gave it to the community, gave it to the city, along with the land around it for a park in memory of her aunt, um, who uh, was a really big part of the Seabright community. Um, so there's a big history with that building, which we could talk more about later, um, but we also do want to look at, you know, it was this really big effort and you can see um, these articles from the time people were, you know, uh, there was a lot of back and forth uh, between the high school and the um, museum board talking about who, who was best able to take advantage of the collections, who should use them, where they should go. Um, and so I think that one of my favorites is this city museum board told high school classes uh, or use the Hecox collection for study. Um, and that actually has to do with this really amazing sassy newspaper article where I quote um, the, the author was quoting the high school as saying, um, that they use everything but the eggs. And so, uh, you know, like they, they use it so much, there's only one collection that doesn't get like regular use. Um, and so the quote is, uh, eggs have no value for educational purposes in Santa Cruz schools, probably because this is an egg producing center. The Board of Education last night told Mrs. Alex Dixon, head of the Santa Cruz Museum Board, that the only part of the Laura J. F. Hecox collection not used by biology classes was a collection of bird eggs. Um, so this was a contentious issue. Um, and ultimately the um, Hecox collection did get transferred um, to our, what is still our museum today, um, but not without some concerns. And so a big change that happened in the collections during this period of heavy use at the high school, um, as we can see here from this article, is that you know, a lot of labels were lost. Um, a lot of identification for different objects was lost. There were a bunch of duplicate specimens and um, other collections had been combined with it that the high school was concerned would somehow get lost. Um, and so they had to make a lot of decisions about what to research, what to transfer. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of pieces of what was originally Laura's collection might have then been lost in that transition. Um, Speaking of transitions, so this is where the Tyrell House was just to orient us um, uh, in comparison to um, the current museum building, which is over here. Um, and it was ultimately condemned uh, and then uh, torn down in 1954. And during that time, the collections was moved into what was then um, the Seabright Library, um, which was also a Carnegie funded structure. Um, that is the Seabright Library now museum building that we occupy today. Um, so it was originally opened around 1915-1916 as a library, so it's a, a small like classical style Carnegie um, library building also built by William H. Weeks, who also built the new high school, who also built the first public library, just as like a nerd fact. Um, and then over the many years that we've occupied this building, it has seen also a lot of changes. So 
Um, this is sort of the opening uh, of the building and many of you who remember coming into our physical spaces probably remember this cast of a ribbon fish. Uh, but we have, you know, folks working on checking out books side by side with cases of coral displays. Um, a lot of physical changes have happened um, in the time that we've been here, including two expansions. Um, people were really excited about expanding the space to better accommodate the natural sciences wing. Um, for those of you who were at our Halloween event last year, you can see our very own uh, city Shearwater um, being used as a tool for people to get excited about the natural history collections that were part of the library museum at that time. Uh, some years later, uh, you know, the uh, library eventually was closed um, and then the museum took over the whole building um, and the collections continued to grow, continued to change. Um, we can see that this like ongoing iterative process of being gifted uh, cones of which a cone collector has many um, or, you know, uh, uh, what is it, uh, strange growths of different kinds of curious wood growths um, or, you know, the museum taking the time, you know, this iterative process of understanding the collections and, and um, improving identification of being closed so that a geology professor could review the geology collections. Um, so lots of changes in the space, lots of changes in the collections. Um, and just to bring us up to the present day, um, for those of you who, uh, you know, have been able to pass by the museum in what has been very glorious weather on walks, I know a lot of us staff have been doing this. We have our wonderful garden. Um, we have uh, a reminder of what our floor plan once looked like for those of you who uh, might miss it. Um, I know sometimes I just go up there to take a break when I'm on site because um, it's just a really inspiring space to be in and we're so excited for when we'll be able to share it all with you again. Um, and, you know, we're taking advantage of the time being closed. Last winter, we did a bunch of repairs and updates. And you can see this is me cleaning the coyote case back when masks were for protecting yourself against arsenic and taxidermy instead of a global pandemic uh, in this both days. Um, and uh, we are, you know, actively making plans right now for how we're going to continue to take advantage of this time for space improvements while we're still closed um, until we can be safely open. Um, so a discussion of the museum's spaces would not be complete without talking about the different dreams um, and plans, you know, the community and the museum have made for different like future locations. Um, so this is a model of like an update for the present day site, what it could have looked like if we had um, decided to renovate here. Um, developing design ideas in 2005, years ago, there were notions of um, being part of a Santa Cruz History Center or Center for Natural History at Pogonip or having a new building in Depot Park. Um, so all these different kinds of, you know, um, dreams of museums, futures, past. Um, and it's always this iterative process of like looking at where we are at, what we can do for our community, um, what they want, what our community wants and needs. Um, and all of this is, you know, a constant like ongoing process that we have to do a lot of work in the background to make sure it's still possible. Um, and part of that work is preserving the collections because, um, you know, the collections is one aspect of the museum. Like I said, it's the aspect that I am very tied to, um, but if we don't take the time to preserve them now in whatever space we currently occupy, they won't be there in the future for us to interpret and reinterpret um, and engage folks with. So now uh, we are going to talk a little bit about preserving our past and the ins and outs of uh, museum collections management and preservation. So I'm gonna, uh, bring Marisa in here in a minute to have sort of more of a conversation about this part of the presentation. Um, but we're really going to sort of look at like the museum. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think is like super compelling about being able to be in the position that I'm in, like collections manager for a natural history museum, is that the contents, of course, reflect the diversity of, uh, you know, the world they're representing. And so just like we, we are always marveling at the biodiversity of nature, there's also a diversity of conservation, preservation, ins and outs and needs within our collections, um, especially for a museum like ours that has like a huge variety of, uh, you know, different kinds of not only natural history, but historical um, and cultural collections. Um, and so Marisa, do you want to uh, go ahead and talk about what you might think of like let's so so let's sort of like call some of those sub collections out maybe okay uh, you're putting me on the spot I'm sorry <laughs> to think about what um what makes up our collections mm -hmm. okay yeah so for a little context too so Kathleen manages our collections and I manage our public programs so oftentimes those overlap like tonight um and so I do have a little experience with this 
Um, and so the first one that comes to mind for me are our fossils and geology because that's one of my, my special areas of interest. So I know that we have fossils, I know that we have rocks. Um, we also have taxidermy, obviously, showstoppers. Um, and in addition, we also have objects that have been created by people. We um, steward collections that um, are made by indigenous cultures from across the region, the state, and even beyond. Um, so those are the first ones that come to mind for me. What else we got? So that, I mean, and that's a really great rundown. I mean, Marisa has been a super important part of the museum for many years. Uh, so I appreciate her playing this game for me where we list uh, a bunch of categories that she's well acquainted with. Um, but this is, if any of you have looked at the collections portion of the museum website, this is an overview um, of like a count of specimens that we have across different categories. Um, and then also, you know, a percentage of how many are exhibited, which is kind of a tool for thinking about like, you know, a museum collections is sort of like an iceberg in that you have like the type of things that we're able to like see and engage with regularly and then you have like this immense number of things that are uh, you know in storage for a variety of reasons whether from lack of space to like specific preservation needs um, and so uh, these numbers are um, going to be updated in the near future um, one important project in the collections right now is conducting our first full physical inventory of items since the 1980s um, that is one goal that we've had to sort of adjust again in response to this whole global pandemic thing um, but I'm really excited to be, you know, moving that forward so we can share out more accurately with everyone. Um, you know, we've had some growth, we've had some change, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, to being able to talk more uh, specifically about that with everyone. Um, and so all these different kinds of things are um, stored in the museum collection storage facility. Here's sort of a rough overview map of what we've got. We've got more than 30 cabinets. Um, and which it, within each of those cabinets, um, we have stored a variety of different kinds of objects. Some cabinets are, you know, one type of object, um, one, you know, sub collection, and some cabinets have a bunch of different objects with a bunch of different needs. Um, and so as we're thinking about, you know, the collections and how we, how we uh, care for them, one thing we have to think about is like where we put them. And a big part of that has to do with like how big they are. Um, and so again, I kind of want to tag Marisa in to think about, you know, or if any of you guys want to think about, you know, from what you've seen of our collections, what do you think is the biggest, maybe one of the biggest specimens that we have? So for me, so think of our collections, we've got our collections that are in storage, but also a lot of our collections are on display. And when I think about that, um, the, the, the head honcho, the big one that comes to mind is uh, that massive, fossil baleen whale jawbone that we have on display. I would say that that is the biggest one. I wonder if anyone watching has any other ideas of um, specimens they remember, but that's what I would choose. So that is an excellent choice. Um, and you hit the nail on the head with the notion that a lot of our bigger items are things that are on display. Um, and so part of that is because they're awesome and we love them, you know, just as a reminder for those of you who haven't been able to be on site and see our exhibits for a while, we've got things like the Macedon Skull, um, the Mountain Lion Taxidermy, the Golden Eagle, um, and again, the um, fossil that Marisa was just talking about. So these things are um, some of our biggest objects and they're on display because we love them, but also because they are simply too big to fit within our current collection storage facility. And so that means that they're gonna have special needs as we attend to them, you know, being permanent display items. Um, so these are some of our larger things. And then, you know, we have in within our collection storage, some of our larger things that have been out here and there for different events are, you know, we have burden baskets um, from Northern California primarily that are about the size of my torso. Um, and that we have, uh, we have a, uh, Taxidermy, uh, a taxidermy turkey vulture is sort of our largest like turkey uh, taxidermy specimen or one of them that's uh, in storage and not on like open display like our golden eagle or like our pelican. Um, so those are some of the bigger things. What do you think of when you think about some of the smaller aspects of our collection, Marisa, or anyone? Small objects. So mm -hmm. uh, small things that we may have within our collections. I would say maybe like an insect. Insects are small. I know we've got insects. So maybe the smallest object in our collections is a type of bee. 
So we do have a number of, we've got a couple sets of entomology cases that have some pretty small critters in them. We've got a couple flies and hoverflies um, and a couple of bees. I think the hoverflies are smaller than the bees. So that's, that was a good, um, that was a good uh, topic to bring up. Um, another thing that we have that's kind of small that I, I'm not sure if a lot of folks might think about us having is something um, like this miniature pomo basket. Uh, I know you probably have some feelings on this basket, Marisa. I just love it. And I think that it's really interesting um, that it is so small. I think that everyone watching can probably tell that, I mean, that's like the size of a, uh, the tip of your finger, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and as someone who um, has made baskets with uh, a minor amount of skill, <laughs> um, it's just amazing the materials that are used to create that kind of detail. And then also to create that, that structure and shape and, and have it actually look like a basket that small is really, really amazing. And a really interesting tool to use educationally as well, which I have used. Yeah. Um, and another thing that I think is like cool about these baskets is that they were often made, I believe, to um, as a show of skill. Like if you could make a larger basket, you could also make this um, tiny miniature one. So it's not just that it was like some sort of like toy or something like that. It was a, a demonstration of like excellence at a craft. Um, so uh, another sort of like in thinking about like the, the scale of things that we have going on in our collections, even smaller than that, um, are these slides of um, microfossils, um, which are an interesting counterpoint to the whale jaw that you were talking about earlier, because, uh, you know, that is a specimen that is like so big, it can only be on display. Whereas these are specimens that are so small, we would actually need to have, um, you know, special infrastructure to have a display where we wanted to show them off. Um, even though we do, you know, have like a microscope upstairs and that's not necessarily the, the right one for this particular object. Um, and then also, you know, these are uh, not local specimens and a lot of what we consider when we're doing our permanent displays or a lot of the displays that we do is interpreting like local regional natural history. Um, and so some things are in storage in part also because they are not able to meet that need or the need for, you know, doing a display that interprets comparisons. Um, and so one thing that we're looking at in this next slide, and some of you who were here for our last talk will remember these specimens, is, you know, this giant clamshell um, from Australia, part of the Pilkington collection. Um, it has specific storage needs because of its size, but also it's not necessarily going to be valuable in interpreting local marine life. Um, and just for comparison of the diversity of scale within sub-collections, we have some of these small olivella snail shells, which that case is about the size of two um, pushpins. Um, so those are sort of thinking about like the general like scope and scale um, like of how we can store things based on their size and how there might be different needs for that within different sub collections. Um, but as we are, you know, thinking about space needs and like, you know, interpretive like exhibit value and need. Another thing that we need to think about when preserving museum collections um, is the, uh, the, the challenges that we face in um, trying to fight against uh, you know, uh, basically agents of decay and the transitions of time. And so uh, a phrase that we have for that um, in collections management is the agents of deterioration. So we wanna talk a little bit about the agents of deterioration for museum collections. Um, Marisa, can you mention what you, what, what does that bring to mind for you? Agents of deterioration sounds sinister to me. It sounds like something out of a comic book. Um, and deterioration, uh, to me, I really, I'm thinking about like tattered cloths and things that are worn away by time. So, um, if I'm thinking about agents of deterioration for a museum collection, I would think of, you know, the things that are going to make it so that our collections don't last. Um, so, and I, and I envision, you know, taxidermied ducks covered in dust. And if yeah. you watch and have uh, anything to add to that, feel free to throw them into the comments. Yeah, so that those, uh, you've hit the nail on the head with a lot of things we're about to talk about. Um, and one of the reasons why we're talking about these agents of deterioration, which is a really sinister phrase that I love because I have a, a antagonistic relationship, I'm sure a lot of us do, um, with the, the foes we're about to face. 
um, in the next couple of slides. And the reason why we want to identify them, even though a lot of them are interactive, they, they're interconnected, um, in some contexts they're not bad, um, in some contexts they're really bad, um, but the better we identify them and name them, the better that we can provide solutions to them. Um, and so the first thing, you know, a lot of people when they think about museum collections are like, oh, this is the place where I need to be careful around. And that's really true. Um, as you can see with whether it's a really um, fragile fossil pine cone or with, you know, a collection of eggs from the 1890s. There's a lot of things that we want to be really careful with in museum collections, pretty much everything. Um, and that is um, part of, uh, you know, a sort of like bigger agent of deterioration that we refer to as physical force. Um, so speaking of physical force, Marisa, do you recognize this picture? Uh, picture? The, the picture or the, uh, the, the picture? The picture. The picture. Yes, that picture on the, on the left there. I recognize this picture. I love this picture. This past year, I, I feel like I use this picture a lot because we were commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, but if I recall correctly, this was from another earthquake, another big, big whopper that we've had um, here around Santa Cruz. This one was the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Am I, am I not correct? 100% correct. And um, also, I believe the subject of this, this picture is something that may be familiar to our members joining us today. If you recognize this, you can um, tell us in the comments and remember to switch to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see what you're sharing. But what is this? building um, that is in this picture. I believe, and I'm not someone who is from Santa Cruz originally, and this building was no longer in existence when I moved here, but I know that this uh, is a building that people have found memories of, and I believe this is the Cooper House. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, and I know that this is, you know, uh, it's one of the few images that we have from within our collections of how, you know, the 1906 earthquake interacted with uh, the local landscape. So it's those fallen bricks that we're really calling attention to. Um, but you also touched on, you know, a different sort of like bigger instance of physical force that some of you who came to the um, from the vaults that was themed around uh, natural disasters and how they're a way that humans interact with nature um, can see this picture. Uh, some of you might recognize this picture that's to the right, um, which is actually one of the very few objects that was damaged from our collections during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, and so, you know, it, one cool thing about looking at this picture is, you know, it had a particular story as an object and then, you know, as when it was damaged, it carried this additional level of meaning. And we talked about that at the From the Vaults talk. Um, but another level of meaning that it has for me is looking at that and thinking about how, because it was sort of an exception that proved the rule, it represents this ongoing history of preservation in the collections and steps that we take to mitigate things like physical force. So from hands-on training or training about, um, you know, handling and, and moving items um, to thinking about like, you know, insulating objects against bigger issues of physical force, like putting bungee cords over shelves and things like this. Um, so that's a sort of, you know, that's an example of like an agent of deterioration that can be sort of like large and catastrophic or like everyday and mundane. Um, is there something else that you can think of, Marisa, that might relate to that sort of tension? The tension of like something catastrophic versus mundane. Um, or that can be both. Or that could be both. So something catastrophic, if I think about it in those terms, so we're talking about earthquakes, so another catastrophe that could hit Santa Cruz, um, and I know has caused catastrophic damage to parts of Santa Cruz, is flooding. So water, um, we, where the museum is currently located, is right next to the ocean, right next to the San Lorenzo River. I know that we saw major water level rise in 2017, which was an El Nino year, and lots of swells and storms. So, um, so I'm going to go with water. Yeah, that is the next agent of deterioration um, in our lineup of ne'er-do-well forces. Um, and so you can see these are um, two pictures from our collections, um, not, you know, they were not damaged in these instances, but it's a picture of, um, you know, flooding in Seabright in 1938, um, and then, you know, waves pounding the snack shack that previously existed before um, where once the Seabright Castle um, existed. And so, you know, just thinking about the ways that like water can have these like sort of like larger catastrophic effects on like buildings and spaces. Um, and you can also have, you know, like something even as mundane as like a water main breaking. And so when you think about ways that you're trying to, um, 
you know, insulate the collections against that. You want to think about how your space is organized. You want to raise shelves from four to six inches above the floor as a minimum, which is not something that's going to help with a giant flood necessarily, but it is something that's going to minimize sort of more the mundane ways that this can cause problems like the breaking of a pipe. Um, and so there's, you know, we could talk, I could talk more about all of these, but um, the next, uh, you know, the next agent of deterioration that's sort of in the same vein of potentially being catastrophic, but also sometimes being like a normal uh, phenomenon um, is what? Do you have any guesses, Marisa? Another catastrophe that could strike here in California, mm -hmm. in Santa Cruz, other than flooding and earthquakes, which are the big ones, the other big one that comes to mind, which we're, we're kind of approaching and maybe already in the season for this would be like wildfires um, and also just fire in general. That's something you got to be concerned about, right? Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, fire uh, is something that we, again, have to like plan for, you know, one of our best tools um, is creating an emergency plan that accounts for how we would respond if fire were to threaten the collections um, and then how we would, you know, uh, you know, address any damage that might occur in that instance, you know, or creating infrastructural changes like we have a fireproof cabinet for our accession records and foundational other sort of foundational records. Um, and so this also is an example, you know, we talked a little bit about how the high school um, fortunately caught fire and was burned down, not fortunately. Anyway, the museum collections was not there when that, uh, you know, tragedy befell the local high school. We're really lucky the Hecox collection wouldn't be here. Similarly, we are all lucky that the Hecox collection contained objects belonging to Ed Fisk, um, ornithologist, this collection's notebook and these eggs, um, because they uh, were the only most of his collection was stored at the California Academy of Sciences, um, which you can see here in this picture was burned to the ground after the 1906 earthquake. Um, so we're really fortunate that these things survived um, and it's a reminder of how important it is to you know, plan for these sorts of incidences. Um, so those are sorts of things, you know, fire, water, uh, large instances of physical force are the wrong kind of force that we wanna keep away from the collections. What's another thing that we might wanna keep away or exclude from the collections? keep away from the collections, things that we want to keep out of the collections. Um, I know that you spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about um, critters. <laughs> and so I would say pests maybe would be like another major concern of what we would want to keep out of the collections, yeah? Yeah, so if the agents of deterioration are bad guys, these ones are my arch nemesis. Um, you know, even that adorable something. little mouse there or rat or whoever that is? Uh huh. Even that adorable, I think it's a mouse, um, you know, and that's a, a funny thing about like pests in museum collections, uh, as natural history museum collections, because in some cases you might have like a very similar, if not the same kind of specimen as the thing that you're trying to exclude. Yeah, and do we have any of your, your big, your big enemies um, in terms of pests as a collection well, the, manager? Do we have any of those enemies as part of our collections that we the want? The one to that I, you know, um, uh, um, the one that I would really say is my arch arch nemesis is this varied carpet beetle. Um, so you can see that here in this picture. And that's because they tend to eat a lot of things that have um, variable organic composition. So they're a big foe of historic taxidermy, for example. And that's like a big part of our collections. It's a big part of, you know, collections that we connect the public with, but also things that are in storage. Um, and the ironic thing about, you know, those is they're a dermestid beetle. And there are some collections where dermestid people beetles are actually purchased and, you know, brought into a museum environment in order to clean specimens. Um, and so, you know, that intention is kind of ironic. And we do have some taxidermy mice specimens um, that, uh, you know, might have looked like the kind of thing we wouldn't want to see around the collection except in the dead form. As long as everything in there stays dead, you know, um, this is a common department phrasing, we're just hanging out with our dead friends, um, then we're happy. Um, the reason I have this, um, you know, article, uh, Reflections on the Anatomy of the Museum that came from the museum's newsletter in the late 1980s written by um, our former curator Charles Prentice um, is because it's sort of like a, it's an encouraging reminder for me that uh, about this sort of duality between like, you know, the um, ecosystem uh, you know, that we're representing as a natural history and science museum and then also the ecosystem we're trying to maintain um, the preservation environment standards um, within the collection and um, just in this reflections on the anatomy of the museum he mentions you know thinking about how like uh, uh, let's see where is it ah, I wrote the quote down but I can't find it right now um, but anyway mentions thinking about how like you know the um, like a, a silverfish is just one you know like um, 
ambient part of the natural world that you know looks at a collections not from the perspective of whether they're like important or informational but whether or not they have nutritional content and in, in a way we can sort of you know take uh, encouragement from that um, which i try to do uh, so uh, we you know we can't be thinking about ongoing preservation of objects um, if we don't have them which brings us to another agent of deterioration which would be so if we do not have the objects, so we're concerned about not having them. <laughs> and so that, I mean, that sounds bad. Um, we used to have them and we don't anymore. So maybe are we talking about theft here? Like actual bad guys? Actual bad guys. So in this realm of bad guys, some are real bad uh, or, you know, actual bad humans. And that would um, probably be a good way to describe the people who stole a set of bats off of public display from us in the late 1980s. Uh, the museum community is real big fan of bats around here, uh, as I'm sure we all are. Uh, and so we had to take steps, you know, we take a lot of steps to mitigate this possibility. Um, and there's lots of different examples we could talk about, but one of them that, you know, is you know, was new to me um, in coming into museums is this notion of using safety screws um, to like have a special kind of screw head that's gonna like mitigate someone's ability to quickly grab something out of a case. Um, so that's another example, but that's not the only kind of loss that we might have, uh, you know, in museum collections, and that's not the only kind of loss related agent of deterioration we've got going on, Marisa. So, okay, so it's not that it was stolen, but it's still lost. So, <laughs> so um, maybe we lost uh, like a catalog card, like we see here on this slide, for instance, like maybe um, or maybe the catalog card says that the object should be on a particular shelf and then you go to that shelf and it's not there. I feel like that's happened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that has happened. That, so that might also be a nemesis of mine, but working on the inventory is going to be, is improving that. Um, so that's another big um, agent of deterioration is dissociation. And so that's just dissociation of a loss of knowledge about the object, um, a loss of, you know, a, a species identification, um, whether an object itself just goes missing, you know, whether or not we have questions about whether an ID was actually accurate. And so part of the work of, you know, mitigating this is constant research into our collections, inventorying them, organizing them, and relates to sort of one of my favorite definitions um, of a museum collections uh, is, or of, of collections management is people who are, um, manage activities that promote the preservation of the physical and the preservation and organization of the physical and intellectual aspects of a collections. And so you have to really think about uh, these objects are not going to be, you know, important uh, in the same way if we don't have the information about them that we need. Um, and so those are sort of like, you know, we have some things that are about like um, different big aspects of the physical environment that might come into the collections or pests. Um, or people or other kinds of loss. Um, there's one sort of area of the uh, of agents of deterioration that we are going to wrap up with, um, and it's something that you talked about kind of at the beginning, Marisa. The tattered cloths and time, so um, and dust, so like air and light and and yeah, dust. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I've sort of classed these four kind of together because I think about them as these sort of ongoing environmental concerns of managing the collections. And so you have things like light and UV um, that, you know, in addition to fading can um, interact with and damage, you know, the makeup of specimens in various ways. Um, you have pollutants, dust itself can be harmful to an object. Um, so we have to clean things, especially things that are on regular display. Um, but you also have to think about different kinds of chemicals off gassing into the air, like you want to use the right containers to house things. Um, and you also have to think about the double edged sword of some objects themselves have pollutants in them. And so like mentioned the taxidermy having um, potentially having arsenic or similar chemicals in it earlier. Um, so we have to be careful when we're cleaning these things. Um, and then having, uh, you know, uh, relative humidity and temperature, which interact a lot, um, be at the right levels is really important for um, stabilizing objects, um, preventing mold growth, um, and, and having them stay consistent is really important, especially in a collections like this, where we have so many different materials that are made of composites of different things, because as temperature and humidity fluctuate, um, you know, physical, uh, you know, materials expand and shrink. And if you have a composite object, they'll do that at different rates and it will cause stress and potentially break apart um, or exaggerate problems with that object. 
So uh, this has been, you know, our like uh, rogues gallery of different kinds of challenges that we face in managing museum collections. Um, and we meet those challenges by using the tools. Oh wait, and here and here's our uh, roundup for the folks at home. Yeah, here's the lineup. It's not a line, but uh, <laughs> but here we are. So and we, uh, you know, we we address these. You know, we identify them so that we can address them, and we address them with various tools of preservation. Um, and uh, we have, you know, a lot of different kinds of things, um, some of which look mundane, some of which don't, um, that we use to uh, work on, you know, maintaining a good environment for all of our different objects. Um, so well, like a, a favorite tool of the trade, Kathleen? I do have a favorite tool of the trade. So there's a lot of stuff here that I use a lot. I'm a big fan of that vacuum, which has a special kind of filter, which, um, keeps different kinds of particles and stuff from like getting out of the bags um, that you would vacuum things into. But perhaps my favorite favorite, oh, and here is like, a, well, this is one of my favorites and it's Ziploc bags. Um, so the material that Ziploc bags are made out of, um, polyethylene is actually like inert and it's really good for um, encasing things, protecting them against dust and pests, but also not interacting with them on a chemical level. Um, so this is, you know, a setup uh, getting ready to like set up and clean some taxidermy. And this is some shelves of our taxidermy, which admittedly look really strange because it looks like we just, you know, plopped a bunch of specimens into a bunch of like, you know, snack bags or whatever. But this is actually a really good way, you know, um, for, for managing the needs of all the different taxidermy we have within the structures that we have. Yeah, I really... Um, brings to mind like an abandoned house that's had like sheets put over everything or like a, an abandoned mall with um, mannequins all covered up. <laughs> it's yes. kind of, it's a little, yeah, it's a little unsettling uh, picture, but it looks like it's, it's doing the job, huh? It is, and it's a, a, an environment that I miss all the time when I'm working off site. It's so nice to be around it again. Um, one of my other favorite tools, so here's just some other examples of tools that we use. So this is a data logger where we're um, tracking, you know, temperature and humidity and things like this. And then this is a sticky trap um, for monitoring if there are any pests coming and going. We've got bungee cords, um, keeping boxes on shelves. And then we have the freezer, which is one of my other favorite conservation tools. We use it to do freezer treatments, which are non-chemically invasive ways um, to kill, you know, if there has been an incident where a pest has gotten into an object where we kill that pest through a freezer treatment process. I have a great anecdote about freezers. If you guys, you know, have time at the end and want to ask me about that, please do. It's a great anecdote, but yeah, we'll see if, if you, if you want it, put it in the chat and we'll, we'll maybe see if we can make it happen. Yeah, if you want the freezer anecdote. Um, Thinking again about sort of custom solutions, how the bags, the birds in bags is like a good system um, for taking care of those specimens like in our specific, you know, uh, within our framework of, of needs and constraints. Um, we also have materials to make custom solutions to support different things like our basketry materials or other objects. And so this is a glass bottle that had a basket woven around it and then um, a sort of like coaster like appendage at the end that was starting to sort of break off and the bottle tilts and so the tilt was putting stress um, and exaggerating the break and so creating this sort of like drop front box caddy um, is a good solution for conserving it and I do want to mention really quickly I know we're getting close to time uh, but you know a lot of what uh, you know working with Native American made materials and other ethnographic items um, it, we strive to do the best we can to steward these objects, even though you know we don't understand them in the same way that the people who made them do. Um, and part of that is looking into you know best practices always, but also engaging where we can in culturally sensitive um, protocols for handling these different kinds of objects. Um, so yeah, another thing uh, you know in terms of best practice, a lot of transitions that we're making in the collections involve you know changing the housing of objects to better reflect industry standards. So um, we switched over our wooden shelves, which, you know, wood can off gas and interact chemically with items uh, to metal shelves was one of the biggest successes um, of last summer or last year. Uh, and this is a project that's going to be ongoing for us updating our storage and housing. Um, this like picture still makes my heart sing. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that, you know, if anyone's curious as to why. Um, and then an another big tool of preservation um, is planning. And so we work on emergency planning. Um, these different organizations have different tools and resources for planning. Some of them are going to be in the slide at the end. 
of the talk that we'll share with you, but another big one is there's different sorts of assessment programs for getting help with assessing the conservation needs of your collections and connecting to conservation professionals. Um, so, you know, and, and we do a lot and we, we try to plan for all different sorts of incidences where we know we're going to interact with some of these agents of deterioration um, or where we hope we won't, but we want to plan for that future. And then, you know, just to sort of end on a note that I find really inspiring, uh, you know, you always, you know, we tend to treat like the past as linear. And, uh, you know, if we're planning for the future, sometimes it's planning for things that aren't good, but sometimes you really get surprised by things that are exciting. Um, and this cabinet, I think, represents that, you know, uh, part of that sort of relationship to historic museum collections, because um, even though as preservation is ongoing, our understanding of our collections is constantly evolving. And this is a cabinet, um, this is a, an object and set of specimens that was able to reconnect us with our past, much like I know we're doing a lot this month on our 150th anniversary um, with the Laura Hecox collection, because this cabinet um, was given by Laura, you know, while she was still alive to the California School for the Deaf, um, which, you know, she had where she had a friend who was a teacher um, for use in teaching and education. She was really all about sharing her collections with people. And then they gave it back to us in the 1990s. And, you know, we're better able to understand her story through like being able to engage with this object when, you know, it's not every day that you get something that reconnects you to a part of your collection that was originally given decades before. Um, so that for me is like a really inspiring and interesting way of thinking about how as we manage these objects, um, we're constantly thinking about supporting them and preserving them so that they can continue to represent these different ways of engaging um, with the present, the past and the future. Yeah, and I think especially, you know, today and this week and this month, thinking about looking, looking back on 115 years of our of our long history and realizing that the museum itself is really a historical object. Like as we've learned, our building is a historical um, building and the institution itself is, is part of that ongoing story and our story continues to change and evolve. And that's what um, we're doing with this program. And then also next week, um, we're gonna continue to look at that long history um, and continue to, um, to steward our mission of connecting people with nature and science by telling the natural history story of that long history. We're gonna have a rock and pop up event next Wednesday where we look at the geologic history since the museum has been open. And then next Friday um, is our anniversary and we're gonna be thinking about our history some more. Um, and also thinking about the current state of the museum, where we are right now, this part of our history, and also our plans for the future, which, you know, Kathleen, you, you've uh, shared with this as well, that there's, you know, you're always thinking of what's next, even as we spend so much time thinking about what has happened before, um, we're always also um, planning for the future. And our members joining us today, you're all a part of that. And as um, stewards of the museum, really by being members and part of this community, you're part of that story and you're helping us do this work. So I just wanna take a moment to thank everyone um, for joining us with that. I also wanna uh, make note, Kathleen, that in a moment I'm gonna ask you to share your freezer anecdote, but not quite yet. Um, we did, we got a lot of requests for it, so it will come, people. But first, I would like to um, share with you all um, some resources that Kathleen has um, developed for us. So this is something that you are all going to get in an email um, after the program tonight. So we're going to send out an email and you'll have all of these links. And these are going to help you deepen your understanding about what we've been talking about. Some of them are historical resources for Santa Cruz and for the museum, and others are about the care of collections. Kathleen, do you have anything else to add about these resources? Um, a lot, so a lot of these things will apply um, pretty broadly, just as like best practices for like home collections, um, as well as like, you know, being like good standard resources for um, like museum conservation. Um, and especially I would say like, uh, the Connecting to Collections Care is uh, a really great community of people who are all like interacting and sharing information and most of their webinars are all like free so if there's something you're really particularly interested in that stuff is it's more designed for people who are active professionals in the field but it's super accessible and it just does that you know it's so many of us are you know 
aware of best practices and striving for them, but having to, you know, work within the confines of our particular situation. And there's such a great community of conservation professionals, like working with each other to come up with those. It's really cool to, to watch. Yeah. And I do think it's cool that we've um, included some aspects of home preservation because this really is something that anyone can do and anyone who um, has something within their own care that they care about. Um, these best practices that museums use are, are oftentimes um, able to be used by, by people wherever they are. And I, I love also thinking about your tools of pres preservation. Like so many of them are thing like we, we do a quick run to Home Depot, right? Or we, um, we go to Ace Hardware or you're talking about Ziploc bags, um, which I think is a good segue into uh, the freezer anecdote, if I remember correctly. I'm also going to just put in the chat here a link to our survey for tonight's program. So um, you're going to get this in your follow-up email as well. But if you also want to click on it now so that it will take you um, to, the, to the survey um, while it's all fresh, please feel free. But, but Kathleen, tell us about your freezer anecdote. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the platform for this. Also, I'm so sorry. I see that you're all, uh, you've been having such an active time in the chat and I wasn't even looking at that during this presentation. I'm really, I very much apologize. Um, I, the way that I'm sharing my screen, I was being silly, but anyway, okay. So uh, the freezer treatment process, um, which is something that uh, the National Park Service has a lot of resources about museum conservation. And one thing that they do is this series called conservograms. Um, some of them are old, some of them have been recently updated, but they're, they're all really good. And there's one about the freezer treatment process, which is a way, like I said, to um, kill pests that have like gotten onto an object without actually having to use chemicals, which is better for the integrity of the object and for the future safety of museum professionals or members of the public who might interact with it. Um, and so the point is we need a freezer and we need it to get to a certain amount of cold, otherwise it won't actually kill the things it's supposed to kill. And our old freezer wasn't doing that. So we were really generously supported to get a new freezer. And I was like, oh, I want the best possible freezer we can get. And so I was looking into upright freezers, you know, because I thought that that would be a better organization than our current chest freezer or the chest freezer we had at the time. But they don't post. I also wanted us to get the most bang for our buck, right? So the interior of the freezer, the square footage is not, or the, you know, they don't, um, the cubic space is not something that they actually like post reviews of on like freezer specification websites. So I was at Home Depot with my tape measure, like measuring the inside of an upright freezer. And this dude walks by and he goes like, you'll be able to fit more bodies with a chest freezer. And I was like, oh yeah. And he like clearly thought that he was like being very funny. And I, I wasn't sure. I don't know how he thought I was going to react. And I was like, yeah, that's probably true. But I want to be able to organize them so I can look at them better. So I think I'm going to try one of these. And then he just ran away. <laughs> he didn't expect you to actually want the freezer to put bodies in. No. And it's funny because there are bodies in our freezer. <laughs> yeah. You can fit like five education assistants in there also. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it makes me think too about Richard Gurney, who is also part of our history, right? A lot of our taxidermy specimens were prepared by um, this, this uh, uh, maverick in taxidermy technology, who's also a local guy, Richard Gurney. And I, I think, you know, like one of the, the aspects of his technique is it's freeze drying, right? And mm -hmm. one of the ways that I know to like, when I look at our specimens and I think, is this a Richard Gurney? specimen did he taxidermy this or did someone else do it one of the things that I consider is size because I remember hearing that like his freeze-dried freezers could only fit specimens so big <laughs> like, so it's a it's a it's a big concern but so if the like our mountain lion pretty sure that that was not a freeze-dried specimen from Richard Gurney because it was too big yeah I don't think that that one is but I but Gurney has been able to do like condors and like other so large things he has a custom built like vacuum freezer setup in his office in Watsonville like that, that can fit a lot but yeah that definitely is an aspect of it yeah um and uh, if anyone else has any questions about the specifics of uh preservation techniques feel free to put them in the chat um now before we end um but kathleen maybe do you want to share some of your current projects that you're working on with the the museum's doors um closed currently and maybe some of the ways that you're going to take advantage of that of that ability to maybe use the the exhibit space so that you normally can't have access to um for your work as readily because it's on display 
Yeah, and I would say it is it is sometimes a challenge because of the different spaces within the museum having like really different conditions um, to try to balance like paying attention to all those spaces. And I know that for myself, I have to really manage like switching into different modes to make sure that I'm attending to all the different um, idiosyncrasies of each space. Um, and so right now doing a lot of like, you know, ongoing regular cleaning and inspections of the collection storage space, working on inventories um, upstairs, I'm hoping during this time that we're closed that we can do. Um, I've sort of been updating the um, gasket seals and a couple of other elements of our different exhibit cases. And I'm really hoping that we might be able to remodel those a little bit better to account for gaps, you know, where these um, specimens or objects are not being fully protected from the exterior elements. Uh, a big part, I'm not sure if I mentioned this during the presentation, but a big part of like caring for collections objects is containerizing the heck out of them, and just sealing them from the outside world as if from time and entropy, even though that's not possible. Exciting. Um, we did get a question from Margaret just now, who is again curious about the freezer. <laughs> um, and she's, um, she's wondering if we're using a special um, freeze dry freezer or the freezer that um, you so painstakingly picked out is like a normal freezer? Um, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a normal freezer. Um, I think that I can actually drop, it's a normal freezer, it just has to be able to get cold enough and it has to be able to get cold enough at a consistent level. So for example, for the first um, couple of months of having that freezer, I kept a data logger in it so we could make sure that it was actually achieving the temperatures that it was supposed to achieve. Um, and I periodically drop that data logger back in it so we can make sure that it's sticking to what it's supposed to stick to. Um, and so here in the chat is the, um, the conservagram about the um, insect control procedure for the freezer cleaning process. And uh, let's see, we do the method where it's two cycles of 48 hours exposure and it has to be at a minimum of negative 20 degrees Celsius. Yeah, and it's not, um, again, it's not like to stop rot, like your freezer at home is probably really good at stopping rot. That's why you, you know, store, store your food in there. Um, but it's specifically because there are particular organisms, those pests that we were talking about, that agent of deterioration pests that have um, infested one of our objects. And so it's specifically about killing the pests that the pest, because certain pests that we're concerned with um, would be able to survive and like warm back up <laughs> once once leaving a regular freezer. And isn't it normal yeah. that um, you you often uh, do this more frequently with the objects that are on display than the objects that you're able to maybe um, secure up more uh, better, like in those plastic bags, for instance, which wouldn't really work for a display um, specimen. Yeah, and so there's all sorts of different ways to like seal things and you can do that pretty effectively with like plexi and plinths. Um, uh, you just have to make sure things like stay up to date and like gaskets stay um, uh, pliable. Um, but anyway, so the, uh, wait, sorry, what was the question? Uh, you, you, um, the freezer, are we more frequently oh. on objects or specimens that have been on display or is it also very much so used on objects specimens that are kept in storage? It goes across those two. So the freezing is really sort of like a, um, ideally we're not needing to freeze things very often. Um, it's, it's more of sort of like when there's an incident where a pest has gotten to something. So things that are in collection storage, I, um, you know, we're always trying to make sure that we're excluding pests from even being able to get there. Um, but especially things that go out on loans um, that are like borrowed, um, or go upstairs for like extended periods of time before those come back into collection storage. Um, we'll freeze them to make sure that they're not going to carry anything that we didn't see at the time into collections because a lot of these guys, these domestic beetles are very small and very camouflaged. They're very sneaky. Yeah, so that's, and Madison was just curious about that. Like, how do you tell when a pest gets into something? So sometimes it's very small, right? Very sneaky. So, um, mm -hmm. but sometimes you can see them. Sometimes, um, I believe you also see evidence that there's deterioration already occurring, right? Which is kind of like unfortunate, but what, how do you know when there's a pest issue or an infestation? So and that's part of like part of a, you know, a good museum housekeeping program is an essential part of like an integrated pest management plan. Um, so there's like so all the plans and documents. So we're always like watching and inspecting and like looking for these sorts of signs. So something that um, you commonly want to look for is just frass, which is just evidence that something has been chewing at an object. So you'll see, you know, potentially like um, 
uh, you could see like pieces of like larval sheds or this is pretty gross um, or you could see like you know bits and pieces of objects that have been damaged by those pests and so it's a lot of like you know you vacuum everything super regularly so you can observe if any changes have happened you do spot checks on different kinds of specimens especially ones that you know are going to be more, more vulnerable um, and for things that are going out on loan just as a general best practice rule um, you want to be able to isolate them and to to uh, you know in a lot of cases you can isolate and observe um, for some cases, for more sensitive objects, you want to just go ahead and freeze them. Um, and that sort of varies, you know, in different museums, like if, if we had like a full isolation chamber, we might do things a little bit differently. Um, but right now we have the freezer. And yeah, and you just have like a regular schedule though too, right? Like in addition to, to looking for, for things or, or having um, something move from storage to on, on exhibit or from on exhibit to storage or that we've loaned out there's also just like a regular schedule of even if you don't see any evidence of anything just as a precaution right not for things that are in permanent storage just because it is like it's it's best to be as minimally invasive as possible when you're treating objects just because they are you know uh interacting with them as little as possible is one way to minimize the uh, overall deterioration of the object um, and so doing spot checks to see if something looks like it has been damaged in some way is definitely something we do regardless but um, actually freezing something it would really have to depend i i would say that um a lot of the sort of richard gurney specimens that were freeze dried do have to get frozen more frequently because the way that process goes is you're keeping more of the actual animal's body like innards and things are still going to be present in those and so there's like more that bugs are going to want to eat um, and so appetizing yeah, it's more appetizing. They're tastier. And so those kinds of specimens, I, I think in some cases, people probably would recommend doing regular freezings for those. Um, I fall into the camp of wanting to like observe um, those more regularly with the uh, awareness that, that you might see things more often with them where you'll have to address it. Wow. So there's actually Thank like- Thank you guys for talking so much about freezers with me. I think about this all a lot. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's, there's a uh, possibility of over, overdoing it and over cleaning. And um, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, one last question, Kathleen, for you. Oh, if only. Will you ever offer a taxidermy class? <laughs> or will we? What do you think about that? Uh, well, if some people, like my sister who asked that question, lived in California instead of Nevada, they might be able to come to some of our events with where we partner with the Norris Center for Natural History, haha, <laughs> when we had in-person events. Um, uh, where we'll, so the Norris Center has like a really like robust um, taxidermy program where it's teaching kids who, people who want to be naturalists or people who want to be, you know, even get into the medical field and are just looking for experience working with bodies. Um, so they have a lot of students that they teach to taxidermy. I think it would be really cool if we were to partner with them on like a, a you know, a more like one-off class for members of the community. Um, but at the very least, we have a regular tradition now of having some of their students come down and taxidermy stuff, you know, on display for us. And it's good for the kids because they, they're not all kids. They're great. They're fantastic, hardworking adults. It's good for them to have the experience of being able to talk to the public about what they do and like getting a sense of what makes people uncomfortable and how to explain the information of something that's kind of intense um, and great for us because we get to be around taxidermy. Yeah, and that's that's another role of a museum like we were talking about earlier is that oftentimes we are we're connecting uh, people who are doing research, who are doing science with the general public in a way that allows both the public to learn about these practices, but also for these oftentimes budding naturalists and budding scientists um, to be able to, to practice sharing their work, which is a huge part of, um, of being a scientist, is being able to communicate your work and also find meaning in what you do. So um, yeah, one of our favorite, favorite partnerships is with the Nora Center and bringing their taxidermy uh, students to the museum to demonstrate what that's like. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see what the future holds for us. And if you uh, want to be a part of that future and want to share your, your wishes for our future and also hear about what we've got in store, here is a link again to our event that we're having on Friday, which we really hope all of you will join us for. Um, and we are going to again have a little bit more of a history lesson um, and explore history, celebrate that history and look forward um, to what's next. So I hope you guys will join us for that. And without further ado, we're going to let you go. Uh, look out for that email from me that will have a, a survey link and also all of those many resources that Kathleen has compiled for us. So um, Kathleen, do you have any final words? Uh, 
really enjoy being able to talk about freezers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a captive audience so thank you for being interested <laughs> it's been so fun and yeah thank you all for participating and for being members and for being a part of this story this ongoing story so um we'll we'll see you next time we'll see you next week and we'll see you also next month and kathleen i guess you could also what's next month's uh collections close-up gonna uh, oh to? so um we have uh you know an extensive fossil collection uh, with a lot of really exciting specimens that we've seen some of i think uh, in collections close up somewhat recently, but um, we have, uh, we're going to look at sort of the intersection between like teaching um, and teaching with paleontology. So we have some specimens in our collections that were um, collected by a group of high school students who were working with a local teacher who was super interested in paleontology and really involved in the history of the museum. And we're going to put that in conversation with a current volunteer, Wayne Thompson, um, renowned for uh, uh, being the person who helped um, prep and display the mastodon to skull that's, uh, you know, awaiting us all upstairs for when we can come back in person. Um, and he is today, you know, an active paleontologist um, working with a couple different organizations and also a, a junior high school teacher, I believe. And so he's going to talk about sort of like working with kids, how paleontology has changed. Um, yeah. So we're excited to have that. Really excited about that. And especially today was the first day of school for certain districts. Um, in the county yesterday was for others. So um, we're definitely, we've got our students on um, on our, our minds and in our hearts as well. And so looking forward to, um, to talking about uh, the roles that students play within our collections, um, as well as digging into one of my favorite aspects of our, of what we got, which are our paleontology collection. So that's going to be great. And just thanks again um, to everyone out there and we will see you next time. Bye.